So now that we've defined and described PE ratio, let's move to the analysis. As I said, analyzing a multiple is not difficult to do if you remember that very simple rubric I gave you in, this, in the last session. I said if you have an equity multiple, which is what the PE ratio is, go back to an equity valuation model. And the simplest one you can think of, the simplest one I can think of is a stable growth dividend discount model. It's the Gordon Growth Model. If you divide both sides of that equation by the earnings per share, you have, the, you have an equation that tells you what the PE ratio for a stable growth dividend paying company should be. And it tells you the variables that should drive that PE ratio. And guess what? There are three variables that drive the PE ratio for a stable growth dividend paying company. The first is the payout ratio, the percentage of earnings you pay out as dividends. The second is the cost of equity, reflective of the risk of the stock. And the third is the expected growth rate. PE ratios are determined by payout ratios, cost of equity, and expected growth rate. Now, some people are concerned when you see a dividend discount model because we know that most companies don't pay out what they can afford to in dividends. If you feel uncomfortable about using dividends, here's an alternative. Use the potential dividend. We talked about this in earlier sessions. The free cash flow equity is a measure of what a company can afford to pay out, not what it actually does pay out. Just replace the actual payout ratio with a potential payout ratio, and you've got the determinants of the PE ratio for a company. Now, how am I going to use this? First step I'm going to do, first step, as a first step, I'm going to take this, this equation and back up and look at the variables that drive the PE ratio. And three very basic propositions emerge. Proposition one, are the things remaining equal? And you can take a look at the equation to confirm this. The higher my growth rate, the higher my PE ratio. It makes sense, right? Higher growth companies should have higher PE ratios. Are the things remaining equal? And this is proposition two. Higher risk companies should have lower PE ratios. You think, but most of the high risk companies I know have high PE ratios? Well, most of them also have higher growth as well. But if you hold everything else constant, higher risk should translate into lower PE. And other things remaining equal, the higher the payout ratio, the higher the PE ratio. But remember, if you hold growth constant and you pay a much higher percentage of your earnings as dividends, you're generating a higher return in equity in your investments. So I would actually restate Proposition 3 by saying the higher the return in equity for a company, the more efficiently it's delivering growth and the higher the PE ratio should be for the company. But as I've mentioned, holding other things constant is difficult to do. Companies with higher growth tend to have higher risk and lower payout. The big challenge in investing is to look at that balance. Is the net effect going to be positive or negative? Because that's what's going to determine whether a company is cheap or expensive. Now, here's the other way to think about this. When I think about investing based on a multiple, I'm looking for mismatches. I'm looking for companies that don't fit the standard. What do I mean by that? Most companies that trade at low PE ratios deserve to trade at low PE ratios. They have high risk or low growth or terrible returns in equity. So what I would like in a perfect company, a company that I'd like to add to my portfolio, are the following. I'd like a low PE ratio. I'd like to buy something cheap. I'd like a high growth rate, because a low growth rate would explain away the low PE ratio. I'd like low risk, again, because a high risk would explain away the low PE. And I'd like a high return in equity. I'd like a company with low PE, high growth, low risk, and high return equity. Now you might say, what chance do you have of finding something like this? Well, it might be difficult, but no harm looking. In fact, if you ever screen for stocks, you take a big universe of stocks and you screen for attractive stocks, this is the framework you should think about for screening. Screen for low price, low price earnings, low price to book, whatever the multiple is. Look for companies that have mismatches that essentially should not trade at low PE. In this case, I'm looking for companies with high growth, low risk, and high return in equity. It's an effective way of bringing in relative valuation into your investment process. So now that we've talked about the variables that drive PE ratio, let's try it out. Let's take it for a spin. And I'm going to try using PE ratio in a couple of sectors to find cheap companies. The first one, I'm going to do what most equity research analysts do, which is do some storytelling. The sector you're looking at is the beverage sector. So basically, I have about 30 companies in the sector. I've listed out the price earnings ratios in the second column. And you know what I'm looking for. I'm looking for low PE ratios, right? Track the table. There are three companies in this sector that trade at PE ratios below 10. One is Andre Wine, the second is Todd Hunter, and the third is Hanson Natural. They all traded below 10. That makes them cheap, right? Not so fast. Take a closer look at Andre Wine and Todd Hunter. You see why their PE ratios are so low? It's because they have the lowest growth rates in the sector. Now take a look at Hanson Natural. It looks much more attractive, right? It's got a low PE and a high growth, but here's the catch. It's a really risky company. Now do you see the problem with storytelling? 
it's going to be a case of on the one hand and on the other hand, at the end, I'm going to ask you to trust my gut. So let me give you a slightly more sophisticated way of controlling for differences. I'm going to go back, way back in time to 1999 and show you the PE ratios for some telecom ADRs. ADRs are foreign stocks that are listed in the U.S. and trade in dollars. Presumably because they have to follow U.S. GAAP, the earnings you see reported here reflect U.S. accounting standards. So you're comparing apples to apples. I'm going to pick a particular stock in this particular table, Telebras. Telebras in 1999 was the Brazilian telecom company. It looked cheap. It traded at 8.9 times earnings, much lower than the P ratios for the other companies you see for the most part in that sector. But here are the two things that worry me about Telebras. One is, if you look at the column for growth, it has lower growth than many of the other companies in the sector. That's my first concern. The second is, even though these are all foreign ADRs, they range the spectrum. Some are from developed markets, like Denmark. Others are like from emerging markets, like Brazil. And in 1999, Brazil was a truly risky emerging market. So Telebras looks cheap, but it's also going to be riskier than the other stocks, and it has lower growth. As I said, storytelling gets you only so far. So here's what I did. I went back to my Stat 101 book. I went to that chapter on multiple regressions. Like you, when that chapter was taught, I wasn't listening. I said, when am I going to use this? I think I found a use for it. If you remember your multiple regression, here's what you have. You have a dependent variable that you're trying to explain, and you have independent variables that you use to try to explain the dependent variable. My dependent variable here is PE. That's what I'm trying to explain. The two things that concern me are growth and risk. So I decided to run a multiple regression of PE ratios for these ADRs against the expected growth rates for these companies and a dummy variable. You're saying, what's a dummy variable? A dummy variable takes on the value 1 or 0. In this case, I set it to 1 if it was an emerging market ADR and 0 if it was a developed market ADR. I ran the regression. Now, when you run a regression, the first two things you check are the R squared. That tells you whether your regression is actually explaining something that needs to be explained whether the dependent variable is being explained by independent variables. In this case, the R squared for this regression, after adjusting for the number of observations, about 63%. That might not look good relative to your stat class regressions, but in finance, that's a pretty good R squared. The second thing you're going to check for are the T statistics to see if the coefficients you have in the variables are actually significant, statistically significant. Both the variables that I used were statistically significant. The coefficients then can be used to get a predicted PE. So here's what I did. I took the regression. I plugged in the numbers for Telebras into that regression. And when I plugged in the numbers, I got quite a surprise. I got a predicted PE, which was well below my 8.9. It was only 8.3. The stock looks cheap, but guess what? It deserves to be cheap. That is the essence of relative valuation. Just because a stock has a low PE doesn't make it cheap. So as you look through this session, think about the four-step process. Define, you describe, you analyze. That analysis yields the variables you should be controlling for. And once you know the variables, you can use this multiple to compare across companies.